All right, awesome. Thank you for joining me on what is, what are we, day three of three? Everyone's feeling super excited, super energized. <laughs> After lunch, getting close to the weekend. Well, this is a good session for that kind of thing, because this is not super deep technical stuff. Um, I'll go into what this session is, but the idea here is this is kind of a day in the life of what, what would this stuff look like in reality? Um, so we've got, some, we've got some funny stuff, we've got some dad jokes, we've got some flight sim, and we've also got some uh, low code, no code. Pretty simple, let's see. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, after that really, really positive start, hate to go negative, but we do have a problem. You may have more problems, I don't know, but the one I'm talking about is this. <sighs> Seems to be a bit of discrepancy between what people want us to build and what we actually can build. Um, not new, but certainly uh, that is a problem, and it's being highlighted more and more as a problem. Um, but it's not new. And, you know, being, having been around in the industry for a little while, like maybe one or two others of you, um, you'll also remember um, things like this have happened before or there's been this focus before. Um, and I think of Richard, the quote Richard Campbell used in his keynote, you know, about history not repeating itself, but it sure does rhyme, that kind of idea. And I was thinking about this, and I started to think, I remember something when we talking about this. And if anyone was around in the industry in the 2000s, and those of you who weren't born then, please don't mention that. That gets me really upset. Um, but there used to be a company called EDS, which I think is, became HP and is now part of DXC, I think. Um, and they had some fantastic Super Bowl ads. Okay, and particularly around that dot-com boom in the technology and that idea of we don't have enough time. Some people like to climb mountains. This was one of them. I like to build planes in the air. I grew up wanting to be on a wing, wanting to be up this high. Sometimes the temperature up at the altitude will reach 60 below. It's crisp, it's refreshing. You never know what you're going to come across up here. Canadian geese, mallards. So that idea of having to build things like just in time obviously is not new. And I started to think about that and as maybe it's just the way my brain works, I thought, hey, they, that was really funny because they took something literal and kind of you know, turned it into something. I thought, what if we could just take that ad and do literally that because that would be interesting, just the way my brain works. So that's kind of the idea of this talk. How can we build some airplanes in the sky? How can we build something as we're going? So just a quick, quick scene setting. What we're going to use for this, we're going to use a range of Azure services, which probably um, a lot of people will be familiar with. Some people might not be familiar, as familiar with the Power Platform, right? and that's going to be a key element of the success. So the, the Power Platform is really designed as a no-code, low-code platform to empower people in the business. right? So these are, I know we use the term citizen developer, which I'm not a huge fan of, because it kind of sounds like you can just grab a random person off the street and give them something to code. Probably they could do that, but the idea is empowering the citizen developers in the, in the enterprise is that these are the people who know the business. These are the people who actually know what the problems are. So it makes sense to empower them where, where it makes sense to solve those problems. And I've certainly worked with customers where I've come across this, because again, it's not new. These are the people in the business for years and years who've been building Excel spreadsheets. They've been building access databases. Um, and I think as developers, we kind of, and certainly as IT pros and security people, we, you know, not necessarily a huge fan of it. But the reality is those kind of things happen because we can't build everything and there's a huge amount of potential value to businesses to be unlocked. I mean, literally millions and millions of dollars in some of the customers I've worked with being driven by spreadsheets, right? Still being driven by spreadsheets. So that's where the Power Platform comes in. It's designed to be a platform that can enable those same people but with a layer of governance and an enterprise view that maybe they didn't have before. And 
Power apps, like a lot of services during the, um, well, I'm going to stop calling it COVID pandemic now. I'm just going to call it pandemic because we seem to have had a few. Um, huge, huge uptake, right? As people switched to remote working and they needed to really change the way they built businesses, uh, business processes. But probably what I saw and a lot of people saw, they were still running as two silos, right? People were building amazing things in no-code platforms like Power Apps. Like if you used a COVID check-in app or anything like that, or those nice men and women in blue uniforms at airports that were checking you in the early days. Because remember back, it seems a long time ago, remember the rules changed like every second day about what you had to do? So literally these are the platforms that enabled those apps to be rolled out that quickly. So immensely successful, but they really kind of happened outside of IT by and large. Meanwhile, we trundled on in our, in our um, code first world. So what's emerging now though, is this middle ground, this idea of fusion development. Hey, how do we combine what pro coders do and that maturity and engineering kind of brain we have around ALM, DevOps, security, all those things, and combine the, that in projects with people who are using these low code platforms. So this idea of fusion development. So that's where these two kind of ideas of building airplanes in the sky and fusion development. So that's what we're going to spend the next ish 40 minutes going through. And let's build our scenario uh, to build those airplanes in the sky. And being the literal sort of person I am, let's use an airline to do it. So of course, being Microsoft, Contoso Air, based here in Melbourne at Essendon Airport, um, been around for quite a while, mainly doing tourist flights and things like that. But like most things uh, in the world these days, we've been bought by a tech billionaire, because that's what tech billionaires do. And that tech billionaire has got bold, bold plans for us. So he's very keen for us to revolutionize and transform the way we do things to get ready for that growth. Um, and you know, we've actually kicked off some experiments you know, in the short time he's been here. So our passenger drone service has been really popular, um, both just as a, as a sightseeing tour um, and as a way, possibly as a way of developing cargo. So that's looking really good. Um, but look, in full disclosure, not all the projects are going quite so well. The uh, combined remote working touring platform being developed by a New Zealand team, look, it's, it's got a little way to go, I'm going to be honest. So, but we, we're in that world and culture of experimentation and learning. So our tech billionaire, he's come into the office this morning and he's booked himself a little joy flight. He's going to go and see, have a bit of a tour around Melbourne. But as he's heading out to the plane, he's kind of tapped us on the shoulder and says, oh, by the way, I've got a few little tasks for you, okay? I want an MVP. You know, it doesn't have to be fully thing, but I want something actually not just thrown together, something we could go to production with, um, and I want to cover off a few things. I said, okay. Uh, so we need a way to know about our aircraft. Because, you know, at the moment, we don't always know, is an aircraft, you know, online? Is it being repaired? We always have to ring up the mechanic, all those kind of things. It takes time. We need to fix that. We need to get much more efficient. Oh, okay. Um, we need to be able to deploy this app to all our flight ops staff, right? So that's everyone from maybe people working at a check-in desk, people out on the flight line, people back in the mechanics uh, area. Okay, we can do that. Uh, we need also need to provide uh, up-to-date cost info for the planes, because one, I don't know if you've noticed, but um, fuel rates have been going up and down a little bit lately, and that has a big impact. So we've often been chartering flights below our cost because of that. So we need that. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and then, yeah, just a few more things. We want to make sure it's easy to change. We want to make sure it's easy to use. Oh, by the way, we also want to connect it to our enterprise um, flight record system. Okay. That was an access database last time I looked, but okay, we can do that. Uh, it's got to be scalable and reliable, you know, because it does. Um, yeah, cool, and I'll be back in 30 minutes because, you know, we want to create that kind of sensation. It's a little extreme, it's a little silly, but, you know, has anyone not had a deadline that seemed like that ridiculous? So that's what we're going to do before he gets back, hopefully, if we keep moving. So, oh, okay, he's already taking off, so we've got to keep moving. He's heading off from Essendon. I don't know Melbourne particularly well, but I think he's going to kind of head south around the bay and back up. So uh, we, should, we should be fine. We should be fine. So to help us on this journey, we're going to use a combination of Azure and the Power Platform. And the good thing is we've got a great team. So we've got Melissa. She's our go-to person. She's that person in the business who builds spreadsheets to solve problems. Right? She's been doing it for years. 
she can take all this disparate information, whack in some formulas and keep the business running. So that's awesome, we've got her. But on the pro dev side, we've also got Jaden, who's our DBA slash data wrangler slash data everything. So awesome, we've got him. And we've got Caitlin, who's our uh, coder, but really she spends most of her time uh, doing integration because there's lots of different systems to connect in the aviation business. So that's kind of her specialty. So she's going to help us out there. Okay. So here's our to-do list, and I think we can kind of split this up into a couple of streams. Uh, yes, left, good, I'm just checking my left is your left. Uh, on the left, which is the thing about, hey, this is the easy to use actual front end bit, that's where we're gonna get Melissa to chime in, because she's done a lot of Excel, and she's done some basic Power Apps training. So we think she can be good to help us out there. And then on the other side, we're gonna use, uh, Jaden, I think I mentioned our flight record management system, which sounds really impressive until you realize it's an old access database. He's going to take that and convert that, convert that into some SQL for us and modernize that. And then we're going to have Caitlin come along and she's going to basically see how we can hook those two things up together so it's not just a uh, couple of silos running. Cool. Plenty of time. We, okay, maybe not so much time. He's to the, this, this, plane, this is our new plane and it's faster because it's red. So possibly we don't have quite as much time uh, as we thought. That's okay, we can do this, we can do this. So first we're gonna start with Melissa. So I said Melissa builds spreadsheets. She talks to everyone in the business, she knows everyone in the business. She gets them to send them their dumps and she builds this consolidated view of the things she needs, right? This is a relatively simple spreadsheet she's built, but um, it basically tells us about our aircraft, it tells us uh, what the current rate, uh, the cost is, the rate, 140, 160, you can see there, how many people the plane can take, uh, and importantly for us, what its status is. Because without, before Maria had this, oh, Melissa, sorry, had this spreadsheet, um, you know, whenever someone wanted to know if they could book a flight, then the person on the desk would have to ring up the mechanic to make sure the plane was available and all those kind of things. Melissa's consolidated that um, into this spreadsheet, which is awesome. So we're going to use this as our starting point, our jumping off point. And... Um, on this particular one, she hasn't done a lot of formatting, but she has formatted that as a table. And I don't know if you've done much Excel, it's been a little while since I've done it, but in Excel these days, when you do little things like that, formatted as a table, that actually has a meaning to Excel. It knows, okay, that's, that's related information. We're gonna use that in a minute. So Melissa's now gonna jump over onto her Power Apps. Um, there's a lot of ways we can build Power Apps. Obviously, we can build them from scratch. We can build them from all different sorts of things, but in this particular case, we wanna build it from Excel because it knows how to do that, awesome. Um, now that Excel spreadsheet is stored on the OneDrive, it's part of the, uh, the Office 365, so we can go and find that and secure it and do all the kind of thing, all the permissions that would normally apply. So we can find our particular spreadsheet and jump on in. And once we do that, Power Apps churns away and produces this amazingly beautiful app. Uh, I think you say it's functional. Actually, it's actually pretty richly functional, more than it looks. Because basically what we're going to get here is a list view, which is this one. We're going to get a, uh, a, an edit slash new field. We've also got, if you look up the top here, we've got some little icons that are functional. So we've got a refresh, a reorder, and an add new. And we've also got a search bar. So as we type in there, that list can be filtered. And then the little arrow on the, on the right there will actually take us to the detail view. So it's not particularly beautiful yet, but in terms of functionality, not too bad. And the good thing is, to get it there, this is where the, the power of the Power Apps or the no-code kind of world comes in, that if you have a look on the right, the kind of thing that we're going to use to format the elements here, that's going to be pretty familiar to anyone who's done PowerPoint, Excel, Word. They're not particularly complex kind of things they're doing. Right? But to us, we might notice that each of those particular views, the browse, the list, the edit, you can see that it's created those um, as different elements in the app. So in our particular world, we might think of that as a view or a whatever. So it's all there, but it's presented in a way that Melissa can understand. Okay, moving on. So the first thing we want to do is that layout with just three text lines isn't particularly attractive. So what we want to do is she wants to go in and actually just change that layout. And there's some simple layouts she can pick there. And hello, Presta. We've got kind of more of a, an image on the left and a couple of fields, which you know, seems right for what we want to do. Next, we want to come along, and the fields that were actually chosen there 
I think one was like the image to a URL, one was like, I think it was capacity and one might have been the engine model number or something, not particularly useful. So what we want to do is come along and change those fields um, of what they are. So we can go through and just edit that and go and just from some simple drop downs, just go and pick, pick what those fields are. So we're going to put in the registration of the aircraft, uh, the model, so in this case it's a duchess, um, and of course whether or not it's available because that was one of those key things we wanted to know. Uh, so now we end up with this, which looks a lot better. Obviously, that image at the moment is just a placeholder image. So that's something we need to fix. So what Melissa's going to do is go up into her formula bar. So if she was working in Excel, this is exactly the same as what she'd see in Excel, the formula bar. And she's going to reference something in the, in the uh, current record, this item. And you can see we're getting code completion, we get pop-ups, we've got all those kind of things to help her choose the field there. So in this particular one, we want to choose this item dot image URL, one of our fields, and hey presto, we've got our, our little app now has a picture of the plane. Much, much easier. So that's something she can do with relatively little training. But if you remember, that I mentioned that search bar. So when the app was generated, that search bar was searching off the fields we had at the time, which is now that we've changed the fields we displayed, we probably want to be searching off those fields. It makes more sense. Um, so she can do that simply by going in there and changing those, those values. And again, she'll get code completion to choose the right values and all those kind of things. So we, this is, we're starting to get past no code, because this is, this is what I would call low code, or you can argue about that barrier. But it's, it's kind of the type of code a lot of people are used to dealing with in Excel and in things like that. Okay. So we could do, now we we'll go through and we'll do the same thing to our view, our detail screen. Obviously it's not particularly impressive, but we can do those same sort of things, muck it around and we get up something a little bit more like this, which is starting to be more useful, which is great. Um, and we can see on the properties there, we can configure things like, you know, color and all the type of things you might do in Excel, you might do in PowerPoint, you might do in Word. But what would actually be really handy when Melissa was doing her spreadsheet, she'd often do things like, hey, if if the plane is of this type of status, then make it green on the background so it's easy to find in the list. So she wants to do something like that in the app. Okay, so rather than just have a color um, defined, um, we actually want to have some conditional formatting. So again, we just go in and put a little formula in, not too difficult. Um, and now we get this kind of features where depending on the plane, the background changes. So kind of interesting. But what's even, to me, a little interesting, being a, being a developer, was if you have a look at this language, and I know we kind of make fun of our low-code friends, um, we can notice some things about this language. Okay, it's, it's written as a, as a function. All the pieces of information are immutable. Is there a programming model we have that kind of has some of those features? So basically what you get nowadays in Excel and now in Power Apps is a functional programming language. I didn't know this. So it turns out that a lot of those languagey smart people, including um, Simon Peyton Jones, who, wrote, who contributed to languages like Haskell and things like that, have spent the last few years working with the Office team actually upgrading the language inside Excel to be a fully functional programming languages. Uh, programming language. So if anyone asks you if you know functional programming, now you can just say, yeah, I've got Excel, I'm good to go. But what they've now done is taken that language, made it standalone and open source, and that's what's being used in Power Apps, but you can equally well go and use that whatever you want. So that's, uh, yeah, that was something I didn't know, so that's kind of interesting. Um, once we've done that, we've got at least a, an MVP of our app. We can save it, we can publish it, and as soon as we've published it, because we're not going through any um, uh, Google or uh, Apple stores, we're going to push that effectively out through the Power Apps mobile app. Um, we're effectively done in terms of getting it out to our staff. Did that go? Yeah. So this is a recording from my iPhone. So the same thing we saw in the web browser there, we can now push out to our staff based on whatever kind of security policies and things we want to apply. And it works exactly the same. We can go and we can filter things. We can go and browse, we get the green for this one because it's available. We can go and edit some things. Change that to full capacity because you know we put a chair back in. All that kind of good stuff. 
And then what that's doing behind the scenes, and we get the red because it's not available. So behind the scenes, though, what that's actually doing is going back and updating the spreadsheet. We haven't changed that yet. <laughs> okay, so when I mentioned things were happening in silos during, the, during COVID, this is a lot of what was happening. People were building apps that were super, super useful, but at the end of the day, it was still updating an Excel spreadsheet, or more probably in an enterprise, it might have been a SharePoint list, it might have been anything, or it might have been the Dataverse. If you've ever heard of the Dataverse product, part of the Power Platform, I don't know what it is with things having to verse on them now, but so Dataverse is a, a data storage platform designed for no-code, low-code apps. We're going to have a little bit of a look at it later. But that's where you can also get those industrial kind of enterprise settings. But for now, we've got a working prototype app. Uh, it's still so, uh, storing to the spreadsheet, so we haven't certainly finished, but we're getting there. Um, oh, here he is. I don't know Melbourne. Where are we? He headed south. Uh, I think that's what people in Melbourne call a beach. Being from Queensland, I know that's obviously completely wrong, but uh, yeah, I don't know. South of Melbourne, somewhere along the bay, and he's turning back. So we've got plenty of time. Um, so now we're going to move on to, OK, we've built our prototype, we've got our app, but it's still writing to that database. It's not really, you know, Excel's fantastic. It's probably not the best multi-user data storage system in the world, and we can't really apply any of the governance we want to apply to it. So this is where our, our Proco guys come back in. So whilst we've been doing that, Jaden's run off. He's fired up the Access database that is our flight record management system. And he's created um, a SQL database with some scripts and all sorts of good things. And that's what's going to form the base of our new, uh, new and improved system. Um, now, we do have the option here. There is, a, just like there was a connector for OneDrive, there's a connector for SQL. If we wanted to, we could take our Power App and point it straight at that SQL database or the stored procedures that uh, Jaden's created, and we could call it a day. But again, not really an enterprise way to approach these things, right? We don't just want to necessarily allow all the apps act direct access to the bar database pardon me, and do who knows what, right? So luckily, we've got Caitlin, who's our integration uh, specialist. She proposes a different approach that, hang on a minute, why don't we put some APIs in front of it? I hear they can really help you out. And then we'll put some API management in front of the APIs, and then we can control and give people access just what we want. OK, sounds pretty cool. So Jaden's job was pretty easy. He took access, he turned it into some SQL, some stored procs, some table scripts, all that kind of good stuff, and generated that for us, created us our Azure SQL database. And then we've got to work out how we're going to build our APIs. Now, we can go Kubernetes, and we can go App Service, and we can choose whatever language we want. Um, for now. You know, we've got 35 minutes left. Uh, we're going to go. We're going to go left on this diagram. So this is a little bit of a tab spaces argument. We could go Azure Functions or we could go Logic Apps. All right. So Azure Functions is just going to run a little piece of code for us. Uh, Logic Apps is a low-code, no-code platform, more for developers. Um, it's a serverless workflow tool. So they're kind of the two options. So let's have a look at both of those. So for Azure Functions. Has anyone written Azure Functions? Nice. Did you know there's now a SQL binding? This is awesome. So basically, the great, one of the great things of Azure Functions is this concept of input and output bindings. So rather than having to write all that code you know, to open up connection to the database, go and do all your stuff, you just define a binding to say, hey, I need to connect to this thing either as input or output. Um, and for the SQL one, we can just say, OK, here's our SQL. I want you to call a stored proc. Uh, called get aircraft, blah, 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 and away you go. And I want you to give it to me as a, an, a list of objects. So literally our function becomes this one line of, hey, return that list. Now, that's not quite true because I had to also write a little POCO class to represent the aircraft. But other than that, we were done. So that's really, really handy, pretty lightweight. Um, and the nice thing is, because it's functions, we can run it now VS Code in our, on our machine. And we can run it. We can run a little test and see that we're actually getting the results back from the database. So we can check all that. That looks pretty good. The other option would be to use a logic app, which a lot of, if you're coming from a coding world, might not be the first thing you think about. But it does have some advantages. Um, logic apps can be triggered by a whole bunch of events, things arriving on a queue, things arriving in a storage blob, um, or things happening in SaaS land, right? So a record being created in Dynamics or Salesforce or whatever. But for our 
purposes. We just want a simple HTTP API. So we're going to pick that and jump into our designer. Uh, if we had parameters, we could just paste a bit of payload there and it would figure that out or we could define the spec. We don't have any in our case. Uh, similarly, we add a connection for a SQL server and you can see all the different methods there. In our case, we're going to execute a stored procedure and again, tell it the connection string, tell it where it's going, all those kind of good things. Um, that's going to go and collect that. And the last thing we need to do is once we get the response back from the SQL server, we need to include that data. So here's a list on the right there of all the different things that have happened in this workflow. And there's, because of my incredibly creative naming standards, it's called table one. Um, and we're just going to drop that into the response object. And once that's done, we can literally hit play. We can run that. We can see that each of the steps succeeded and, and the response time. Um, we can drill in and see what each of the inputs and outputs in each step of that workflow were. And this is where I was saying it does have some advantages over something like a, a Azure Function because this information can be persisted across every single call. So if someone says, hey, it started failing yesterday, you can literally go in, browse, find those calls that failed and look at every single little input and output out of each step, which is kind of handy. And then we can drill down and see the raw, the raw data that came back from that. So that's pretty cool. So I think for now, we'll just go with this one. We can always change it later. So basically, so far, we've got our Power App, we've got our SQL database, and we've got an API written as a Logic App. But somehow, we now need to join those two in a kind of an enterprise way. So whoop, whoop. click a delay. Come on, you can do it. There we go. So this is where Azure API management comes in. And I'm a developer, and I'm kind of ashamed to admit it, but this is actually my favorite product in all of Azure because it hides all sorts of sins. You can do all sorts of cool things with API management. So we're going to just jump into API management, and we can expose all sorts of different types of APIs we can see here. If we've got an open API spec, we can just ingest that and define that in the way we go. Um, because we've got to be cool now, if you're doing GraphQL and all that kind of good stuff, it can support that. Um, or if you're using something on an Azure service, you can just directly import it from there. So we're going to do that because, hey, we've got a Logic App. So we're going to jump on. We're going to you know, spend hours and hours coming up with a good name for it because that's you know, usually the hardest part of API is this naming things. Um, we're going to enable versioning. So we're going to be able to, on our front end, have different versions of this API exposed, which could do completely different things on the back end. We could have version one going to our Logic App and version two might end up going to an Azure function or something we've written in Kubernetes or wherever. So we can do all this kind of cool thing. So we can do all that. And then we get down to what is the real power of um, API management. It has this, basically this flow, it, well, it's really hard to see from down here, um, where when these calls are made to this API, uh, we can apply what are called policies, both on the inbound route and the outbound route. So those policies can be all sorts of things, right? So it can be something like uh, rate limiting. Let's say we don't want people to be smashing our backend system um, for something that doesn't change terribly often. So we might say, hey, case, you know, uh, we're going to rate limit this particular person from calling us only once every minute or once an hour or once a day. And that might vary for different types. So you might use this same API to expose information internally to internal customers, but maybe to your supply chain partners. Um, and you, maybe you trust them a little bit less. So you say, hey, our internal teams, we know where they live. We can find them and hurt them. We'll let them call us as much as they want. But for external parties, they can't call us more than once every minute. So they can't kind of DDoS us or anything like that, either deliberately or not deliberately. Um, but we can case responses. We can do mock responses. And I didn't. it took me a little while to wrap my head around how powerful mock responses were. But to give you an example, it's basically a hard-coded response for a given set of parameters. And it's defined at, AP, at the APIM level, so it never even hits your back end. So I have financial customers who, you know, want, with all the new regulations, they have to publish this information about their products via an API. They use that. And every time it changes, the description of their product changes, they have a DevOps pipeline which updates that mock response. It doesn't even go anywhere near their APIs. So it can be super, super powerful. Okay, and then once we've done all that kind of good stuff, again, it's got built-in testing. So now we can test directly from here that we can get from our APIM API right through to the actual API and check that all our policies and things and procedures are all working. Cool, we've got that. Now, we've got APIM, we've got API, we've got database, but we've still got to connect to the Power Platform. 
I don't know, the button that says Power Platform, probably a good, good thing to have a look at. So there's lots of ways to do this, but this is, for the point of an MVP, this is the, a really simple way. And just like we had a connector for OneDrive, and we could have one for SQL in Power Apps, what this is, is going to effectively do is take our API that we've just defined and expose it as a custom connector to the Power Platform. So we click on that. In this particular case, we're going to pick which environment, and I'll get to environments in a sec, which, which part of our enterprise landscape in Power Platform we want to expose it to. And presto, if we go into Power Apps, we'll now see another connector called, hopefully, Get Aircraft. Oh, Contoso Air, Get Aircraft, which is what I called it. We can go back into our app, which up until now has been getting its aircraft data from the spreadsheet, and we can reconfigure it to use that. And now we're effectively calling our backend system um, all the way from Power Apps using a securely managed way. So that was cool. OK. Uh, where are we? Oh, I think that's us down there. Wave. Wave, yes. OK, good. I just realized I should have made the weather change every video because, you know, we're in Melbourne and that would have been funny. Um, not to worry. So if we go back and look at our to-do list, it's MVP. I get that. But I think, I think we're... Okay. So being an eccentric billionaire, he's given us one last little task at the last minute, you know, because in his eccentric... What does this say? Oh, oh, he did mention that, the customer feedback form. So apparently in tourist kind of related business, customers are really important. And the way they've been approaching this until now is sending people an email afterwards. And what they were finding was, A, people didn't respond to it. And by the time people got off a plane, if they weren't happy with the experience, they'd already tweeted about it. So the damage was done. So what he wanted was something, that, something really lightweight that we could go and gather some feedback as people got off the plane. Um, and capture that immediately. So we said, I didn't think we were going to do that today, but okay, plans change. All right. Uh, we haven't got long. That's actually going to be tough. Um, if only there was something to help us that could do that. What do you know? If anyone saw Microsoft Build, one of the new features in Power Apps is called Express Design. And the basic idea is... Whereas before we built our app by pointing at a spreadsheet and it generated that out off a template, what we can actually do now is draw the form we want. So that could be hand-drawn or it could be mocked up. So that's my beautiful one I did in PowerPoint because I cannot draw at all. Um, we can give that to Power Apps and Power Apps will try and generate an app for us using an AI model. So I think in the time we got left, we can definitely do that. So coming back to the start again, where we started from, we, you know, before we used the Excel, but you'll notice over here we've got image, which is in preview. So that's the thing where we can upload a hand-drawn image or a PowerPoint or something like that. Uh, but we've also got Figma. I've not used Figma because I have zero design ability, but I hear it's super popular for designing prototypes and wireframes, all those kind of things. So if you have a designer who's worked on that, you can literally import that and it'll do a uh, pixel-perfect kind of app implementation. In our case, though, we're going to go with my dodgy PowerPoint version, because that's about all I can manage. So are we going? Yes, good. OK. I'll come out here, because it's way easier to talk looking at it. So to get this going, all we've got to do is go and pick image. Uh, it's going to give you some examples. This is, like all things in AI, it doesn't do everything. This is not for complex government, multi-page, multi-colored you know, forms with all the labels that go sideways and super, super complex. But if you've got a relatively straightforward, straightforward form like this, it gives you some examples of the types of things you might do, um, then this, this could work. In my case, I'm going to upload um, a little screen grab I did of that, that wonderful um, uh, prototype. I'm going to say, oh, I want it to work on a phone layout. It's going to crunch away and run some AI. And so what it's done here is the AI has come back and it's tagged what it thinks the different parts of the form are. All right? And it's not perfect. On this, because I'd use PowerPoint, it's almost always perfect. But the hand-drawn ones may be 80% because my hand drawing's terrible. Um, but you can see it's tagged, you know, it's, okay, I think that's a heading, that's text. I think that's a field label. And it gives you some examples of the sort of things it's looking for. So you can help kind of do that. And 
even in this case, so for example, it picked up date, that's a field, but it just had it as a text field because that's what I had. But I can go and tag it myself and say, no, 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 I want that to be a date picker, even though it was a text field. So I can do that, go through those and change them. And then I go next, and it says, right, now where do you want to put the data? So this is, you basically have the choice, well, look, just skip this for now, I'm going to write an API or something. But in this case, we don't have time, so we're going to say, okay, we want to put that in the dataverse, which is way better than the metaverse because it's got data. Okay, and then it's going to go, okay, you want to create a dataverse table for this. Now you can see it's picked up that, okay, that flight number, that's the label that goes with that field. So those things go together. So, and it's worked out what it thinks the data type should be. You can go and tweak that and change that, change the names, do all that, so you can get it a little better if you want to. Um, and again, remember, this is supposed to be something that Melissa could do, someone who's used to using Excel. Um, you know, once she's been shown how to do this, this is pretty straightforward. You know, it's not going into int 64s and blah, blah, blah. It's, hey, it's a number. It's a letter. It's a text. Um, but it also, you would notice there, it said email address. So it has all those kind of business level concepts beyond just a string. Um, so it's going to give us a last view of, okay, these are the columns I'm going to create in the database for you. Okay, that sounds fantastic. I just love the database. Go and create it for me. Off at Trundles creates the dataverse table. We need to back that up, and then it's going to wire it up. Come on. I like the really positive messages it gives you. It's like, we're almost there. We can do this. So there you are. Again, it's not the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. Um, but in terms of, you know, he only gave it to us a few minutes ago. We've got, now got a form. Uh, it's hooked up to a data store. That data store is protected by all the sorts of policies and governance we want to put in place around it. Um, we can define for different groups and different apps, hey, you can read this and not that. You can edit that column and not that column. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty simple thing that we can just put in front of people, go, hey, how did you like your flight and all that. That's the idea of it. Um, but you can kind of see where this stuff is going. It's pretty cool. So that's, that's running in the web browser, uh, in the design studio. And exactly the same as before, I go to my Power App on my phone, and that app is now on my phone. So we can start testing it immediately with, um, with staff. So that's great. And that's kind of that traditional low-code only solution. But the great thing is, once it's in that Dataverse thing, as a developer point of view, there's lots of things we can do with it, right? So, for example, every time things happen in that Dataverse, there are events that are raised that we can hook into with things like, you know, um, Azure Service Bus, we can send messages to that. Um, Event Hubs, all those wonderful logic apps we saw. So just like we had a HTTP call or whatever, we can say, hey, whenever anyone submits a new record there, go and run this logic app, which will go and do some, some kind of thing. Um, we can also go the other way and actually write code as plugins into the Dataverse so that, hey, inside the Dataverse, when these things happen, do all these things and actually call out to our services as part of maybe validation. So, for example, they put in some kind of, hey, I had it flying on flight 123 and there is no flight 123. I don't know. Whatever you like. So that's kind of the reverse where we're running it from there. Or if it's things like, hey, we want to actually analyze that data and do things with it as a whole, we can uh, use a, a Synapse link to actually just suck the data that we want to analyze out of that into Azure Synapse, and then all that data and analytics people who love living in that world can go and do their thing. So it's just another integration model. In the first one, when we built the app, we were like explicitly calling APIs. This thing, this other sort of model is better suited where, hey, the business process might be entirely within that kind of business-owned part of the world, but we want to take that and do things with it across the enterprise. So lots of, lots of choices there. So, oh, okay, he's back at Essendon. Oh, yeah, we've got time. We're good. We're good. Um, so I kind of ran through that. It was a bit of a contrived scenario. Um, but for, to get to an MVP, that was, that was pretty powerful in terms of how we could work together with the people in the business who knew the business and do all kind of things. Kind of left out a little bit of stuff, though. All right? <laughs> Our spider sensors as as developers and IT pros was probably tingling to say, you didn't do DevOps, you didn't do source control. It's like, yeah, 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 I know, I know, we're getting to that. So just like we went through and created the logic app in the designer in the web form, that was super awesome and it makes a great demo, but that workflow is just a JSON document. 
you can edit, you can have that same experience editing in Visual Studio Code and check that into source control and do that. All the stuff you saw me doing for API management, guess what? That's also can be configured as code and pushed through DevOps pipelines, which is exactly what you do. And the Power Apps side of the world has that as well. It looks a little different. It's a bit like, you know, oh, we do DevOps, yeah. Do you do it for your databases? Uh, okay. It's a little bit like that. There is ways to do it, but the tooling is different and the kind of model is different. So in the Power Platform, we have this concept of a solution, you know, because Visual Studio wasn't enough to use using solutions. But it's like all the parts, if you think about the, I mean, we only use Power Apps here, but there's Power Apps, there's Power Automate, which is kind of like what we saw with the Logic Apps, but more aimed at, at the citizen developer. Um, there's Power BI, there's bots, there's all sorts of things in the Power Platform. And all those components can be deployed as a solution. So they're managed as a solution. Um, and so all these different things can be packaged up. And that's awesome. So if we go and have a look at our little example, there's hardly anything in it, but you can see we've got two apps, the aircraft one and the customer experience one, in our Contoso solution. Right? So what do we do with that? Well, as I said, even though it's a UI there, sitting behind it is a whole lot of code. So we can manually export it and actually have a look and yay, it's YAML, because you need YAML. Everything needs YAML. It's like red planes go faster, it's better tech if it's got YAML. But you can see all the, all the pieces we saw there, so all the, you know, everything from the theme uh, to all the different things, it's all YAML and it's all source controlled. So we can take that out, we can edit it, we can put it back, we can do whatever we like with it, including building DevOps pipelines. So whether you're using um, GitHub Actions or Azure DevOps, um, there are tools to help you do those various parts. But if you have a look, some of them are kind of new, right? So basically we export a solution, which gives it to you, but it gives you the binaries effectively. So you don't have access to the source code, so you need to run an extra step, which is unpacking. So right, go into that file and pull out the source code and do things and commit that in. And you can work that way through, right? So you build through. So the tooling is there to do it. Um, it is really different from if you're just using, your, uh, you know, working through a code sort of basis. So it does take a little bit of wrapping your head around. Um, but it's all, it's all doable. Um, and there was a great session this morning, I don't think Andrew's still here, Andrew Coates, one of my colleagues, ran a session all about that. Um, so obviously that's finished now, so unless you've got a time machine, that's no good. But in a few weeks, when these are up on YouTube, um, I'll put some links later on in my stuff. His session went into the, you know, walks you through the process of here's how you do it, here's how you do it, um, including, because you know, we're, it's all about being meta, um, there's a thing called the Power Apps Center of Excellence Kit, which, guess what, contains a Power App that runs DevOps for your Power Apps, because that's how we roll. So it's literally, it puts together all that complex stuff under the hood for you, and then exposes it as a Power App to Power App users. So once they've finished their app, they literally get a screen that says, hey, I want to publish this to my dev environment or my validation environment or my production environment. And it, behind the scenes, it's doing Git and pull requests and the whole bit. But from Melissa's point of view at the front end, she doesn't know it. Now, if you're coordinating that with some other stuff, like some pro code stuff, like we've built in our API management, you might need to link those pipelines together to say, hey, when you do that, you also need to go and do this. But that's all doable. So, kind of heading back to wrapping up now. So, I guess, yes, good. Looks way, way on the left on the big screen. Um, I guess we've tried to focus on that middle ground today. That's kind of a bit of a taste in life because um, certainly not something until I started to look at this that I'd been involved with. I think primarily thing the low-code world is still running in its own and we're kind of over here in the other code. But I think the, uh, the opportunities from working those two things together are uh, immensely useful. I mean, the simplest thing that occurs to me is how many CRUD screens have I built perhaps in my life? A lot. Wouldn't it be awesome? Maybe I don't need, to, and this could be even me building it, maybe I just go and build a power app to go and edit those reference data tables. You know, later on we can come back and build a, a, an app if we want to, if we don't want to. So even for our own uses, um, it offers some really interesting opportunities. So yeah, so I think to me the exciting thing is you know, there's lots of people that get super excited about this. Add in the technology here, it's even better. 
But what's most important to make this all work long term is also how do we as developers and architects and IT pros help those new people that are coming on and building these apps um, incorporate in that engineering brain, that awareness of security and things in a way that still allows them to unlock all that great value, but without you know, the risk of John from accounting sending everyone an email in our database attaching everyone else's financial data. So there's lots and lots of controls there, but it does take um, some awareness, and I think there's a, there's a big role for us to play now. If you want to get started with this, um, there is a free dev plan, which is awesome. Because I went to do this in my Microsoft account, and guess what? <laughs> All the governance that I just said is really awesome stopped me doing a whole lot. Um, because, yeah, because of where I was trying to build it. But develop a plan you can go and get for free. Um, which will give you access to all the stuff I've shown, including the Dataverse and all that kind of good thing. Um, there is also a really good book on Fusion development, which literally walks you through, again, free. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff on Microsoft Learn about Fusion development. So there's lots of learning stuff on Power Apps and there's lots of stuff on Azure, but there's now actual dedicated courses. What I've done, I've created a repo if you want to scan that QR code. Um, basically, just, just with all the, all the links and everything I've kind of spoken about here today. And once the videos are, are up on YouTube, I'll embed them both for my session and Andrew's session this morning, because I think they kind of bookend each other really nicely. And I think we've made it. There was one slight error in my presentation. I don't know if anyone's picked it up but on that slide. But it's not Melbourne. Don't, don't tell anyone. Um, yes, so that's it. So is there any questions? Everyone's running home right now to make power apps. Yes, I did this talk in Brisbane, so I filmed it for Brisbane, and then I thought I'd switched over to Melbourne. So that's Brisbane Airport. That's where I'll be going back in a few hours. Isn't it nice? Awesome. Well, there's no questions. Enjoy the last, what, one hour or so of uh, NDC. Thanks very much. <laughs>